no video game truly started existing out of thin air. For example, as you may have heard, the legend himself, Mario, was partially inspired by the landlord of Nintendo's first storage facility in New Jersey, Mario Siegel. However, some video games have some really, really surprising connections to toys, other entertainment properties, and in at least one case, a massive pro-environmental movement. Let's jump right in by talking about two of the most popular toys of the 1980s, the surprising connection between the Nintendo Entertainment System and Teddy Ruxpin. Teddy Ruxpin was the stunningly popular toy produced by Worlds of Wonder, and in 1985 and 1986, it was probably the hottest toy in existence. If those years sound important to you as a Nintendo fan, then you are an apt observer. Nintendo made its North American debut in October 1985 after having been sold in Japan for the previous two years. So here's the thing. American retailers were not interested in video games. The crash of 1983 was still very fresh on their minds, and the sellers weren't buying. Nintendo was obviously located in Japan, and while Nintendo did understand the retail economy of their home country, they didn't have a clue about how it worked in America. They also had no connections to America's biggest retailers, including Sears, JCPenney, Target, Walmart, and more. Worlds of Wonder had hired ex-Atari salespeople, pe people with skills and connections, to market Teddy Ruxpin. In 1986, they added a second toy, Laser Tag, which also flew off the shelves. Sensing an opportunity, Minoru Arakawa, president of Nintendo of America, approached Worlds of Wonder with a deal. They would pay Worlds of Wonder to market the device alongside Teddy Ruxpin and Laser Tag. The deal was agreed to, and Nintendo paid Worlds of Wonder a fee. However, many salespeople spoke with Worlds of Wonder management and thought that this was a bad idea. They believed that video games would be a drag on their industry. The lack of vision. The deal worked great. It helped launch Nintendo into the arms of American consumers. From there, the product basically sold itself. Nintendo sold 3 million units by 1986 and sales more than doubled in 1987. How successful was the partnership? So, the salespeople that sold the Nintendo. Nintendo had to cap their commission at $1 million per person. Yeah. Then, the inevitable. The toys reversed. By 1987, Teddy Ruxpin and Laser Tag's moment had passed. Nintendo was still riding high. Meanwhile, Worlds of Wonder had ordered too many Teddy Ruxpins and was sitting on inventory. The end result? Nintendo, not Worlds of Wonder, was in the driver's seat. Arakawa broke off the partnership. Even better for Nintendo? Worlds of Wonder was about to lay off much of their sales force. Nintendo did everyone a favor and hired these experienced sales hands for their own company. Worlds of Wonder would close in 1991, although both Teddy Ruxpin and Laser Tag live on in various forms. By the way, if you think that Nintendo was the only one to try this brilliant idea, you are wrong. Sega, learning from Nintendo's success, tried the same plan a few years later. Their dance partner was Tonka Trucks. Sega's home console system began with the SG-1000 in 1983, but that system was only released in Japan. In 1986, seeking to break into the American market, Sega established Sega of America. This was done in part as a precursor to the launch of the Master System, which was released in North America in September 86. Sega's challenge was similar to Nintendo's. They knew how to sell a product in Japan, but not in America. That year, Sega was able to sell around 250,000 units of the Master System, but Nintendo sold around 1.1 million units that year, so Sega was clearly struggling. In total, Nintendo controlled a massive 83% share of the video game market. In search of a better way into retailers, Sega went looking for a partner. Tonka was one of the better known and more well-established brands and toys. Formed in 1946, the company was well known for selling popular car, truck, and construction toys. They had long established relationships with toy retailers, an in-depth sales network, and a well-known brand name. In other words, everything Sega could have wanted. In 1988, still struggling with their own operations, Sega signed a two-year licensing deal with Tonka Toys. The agreement meant that Sega would now be distributed, sold, and marketed by Tonka. Tonka set to work immediately, investing upwards of $30 million in marketing of the relatively unknown system. The problem? The deal didn't work. Unlike the Worlds of Wonder Nintendo partnership, which saw Nintendo make money hand over fist and eventually outpace Worlds of Wonder's own toys, the Sega market share continued to decline against Nintendo. The Master System sold less than 1 million units during the two years of this partnership, a paltry number especially when compared to Nintendo sales. There were a lot of reasons for this, but from a Tonka-centric perspective, the company didn't know how to market a video game system. They didn't localize European or Japanese hits, instead choosing to launch lower quality games that had failed. They also failed to recruit any other third-party developers, which in all fairness was a massive challenge given that Nintendo's licensing agreements demanded multi-year exclusivity. In 1990, the contract expired, 
and Sega brought marketing and distribution back in-house. Speaking of Sega, what do Al Gore and Sonic have in common? If you said love of the environment and fast red shoes, you're right. Okay, not the red shoes part, but, but the environment's definitely true. Move past the Al Gore part for a second and concentrate on Sonic. Think about the game itself. You fight against a robot who is regularly destroying the environment, using machinery to cause pollution and pain. As Sonic, you destroy these robots. In so doing, you are constantly freeing little animals and saving woodland creatures. Sonic was completely influenced by the burgeoning environmental movement of the 1990s. According to Yuji Naka, co-creator of Sonic, quote, Dr. Robotnik is a slightly radical representation of all humanity and the impact humanity is having on nature. With Sonic, I was given the opportunity to express my views in a different way and did so, showing Robotnik using pollution and creating machinery which desecrates the environment and it is down to Sonic to change his ways. To be clear, Sonic's pro-environmental attitudes are more present in some games than others. Think of the final stage of the original Sonic the Hedgehog, Scrap Brain Zone, filled with polluted skies, industrial buildings, hazard stripes, and pipes everywhere. Think about Sonic CD. In the bad future, technology is dominant over the environment, but in the good future, technology and the environment work hand in hand. The strength of the environmental movement would ebb and flow throughout the series, but it is clear that the themes of the 1990s environmental movement left a mark on our favorite hedgehog. Switching gears for a moment, let's go to one of the most well-known, hilarious, and underperforming before its time controllers ever. I am talking, of course, about the Nintendo Power Glove. The idea was great. The Power Glove turns your hand into the controller. In theory, it was a virtual reality-like device. You could control the gameplay based on the movements of your fingers and your hands, making it seem as if you were truly in the game. Nintendo leaned heavily into the device, marketing it to the tune of $1 million. Nintendo even went as far as to get the Power Glove a spot in the 1989 movie, The Wizard, which gave birth to this famous line. I love the Power Glove. It's so bad. They invested in the product despite the fact that it was only a licensed product, not something designed directly by Nintendo. Maybe this explains why the device barely worked. Users complained that the Power Glove set up poorly when it came to playing regular games and that the controllers were non-responsive. It was something that was just too futuristic. Yeah, about that. The device was invented by Thomas Zimmerman, who first developed the idea of a glove that would allow you to play musical chords out of thin air. Indeed, the idea for the glove was patented as early as 1983, and the company was formed right around that time. As originally designed, the Power Glove was data heavy and fragile. Eventually, the men realized they needed a new design. The end result? RoboCop. According to John Gentile, who worked on the glove, we were after a RoboCop kind of feel. RoboCop, released in 1987, features a cop destroying crime in Detroit. His suit is a massive part of his crime-fighting arsenal, and his glove, of course, is an integral part of the fighting, and the punching, breaking, etc. So, if the Power Glove's futuristic look ever inspired you to destroy miscreants on the streets of Detroit, there's probably a good reason for that. If you're watching this video, then you don't need a long explanation for what Atari was or their impact on the video game world. Founded by Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney in 1972, the company would basically be the initial drivers of both the arcade and home console market. The Atari 2600, Atari's most successful product, would sell more than 30 million units and pave the way for the success of the home consoles that we know and love today. Less known, Chuck E. Cheese. The company, founded in 1977 as Chuck E. Cheese's Pizza Time Theater, served as one of the first franchise arcades in the country. Its pizza, arcade games, and robotic music animals, led by the aforementioned rodent, Chuck E. Cheese, introduced countless kids to video games, served as a site of hundreds of thousands of birthday parties, and would later become the site of innumerable brawls between parents angry about bad pizza or something. For all its ups and downs, the franchise still holds 561 locations as of this writing. So why are we talking about this? What could Atari and Chuck E. Cheese possibly have in common? That would be Nolan Bushnell. He founded both Atari and Chuck E. Cheese. A serial entrepreneur, Bushnell ran into challenges with Warner Communications, the company that Bushnell sold Atari to in 1976. The two companies clashed from a cultural perspective, and Warner made a series of decisions that angered Bushnell, including ending Atari's pinball line and sticking with the Atari 2600 rather than innovating to a new system. Bushnell began to experiment with new lines of business. This included the idea of finding new places to place arcade games. In the 1970s, Bushnell began actively seeking new outlets for his games and came across the idea of creating family-friendly restaurants that were packed with arcade games. In 1977, while still with Atari, Bushnell was able to create the first Pizza Time Theater. That restaurant featured games, easy to make pizza, and the animatronic rat that sang songs. Bushnell came up with Rick Rat's Pizza as a name, 
but his marketing department, thankfully, convinced him to use another name, and he instead went with Chuck E. Cheese. The name stuck. Bushnell was fired from Atari in 1978 and purchased the franchise back from the business for half a million dollars. He opened more Pizza Time theaters in the 1970s and 80s. Interestingly enough, one of his co-developers for that restaurant was Robert Brock. The two opened franchises together before Brock found a new partner with the same concept, leaving Bushnell to open Showbiz Pizza. In 1984, Pizza Time went bankrupt, and in 1985, Showbiz Pizza purchased the company. The resulting brand became Chuck E. Cheese. Just think, if Bushnell had stayed with Atari, Chuck E. Cheese might have wound up in video games. Speaking of Atari, let's talk about another way in which the company's screw-up had a massive influence and connection over the rest of the gaming world. One of the many challenges that Atari faced over time was the massive proliferation of poor quality games, usually designed by third parties, that ultimately drove down the price of cartridges to unprofitable levels and made buying the system not worth it. The irony is that Atari planted the seeds of their own destruction by creating an environment which ultimately led to the birth of third party developers. It's 1979, around the height of Atari's popularity, and the company's developers are getting pissed. First, their pay sucks. David Crane, who would eventually be one of the four co-founders of Activision, realized via a company memo that he was only getting paid $20,000 a year, despite the fact that he was developing products that generated around 20 million. Crane was hardly alone in this realization. Ray Kassar, CEO of Atari, was charged with keeping costs down and was less than amenable to pay increases. Developers didn't like the treatment they got from Atari Brass, but particularly from Kassar, saying they felt he disrespected them, ignored them, and treated them like cogs in a machine. Kassar would dispute that point, saying, quote, I really had great respect for the programmers because I knew that's where the products came from. Furthermore, developers felt that they were artists and were upset that they weren't getting any attention or even credit from their products. In fact, it's this lack of attention that led to the infamous Atari Easter egg in which developer Warren Robinette hid his name in the game. Angered by the direction of the company and believing that they could do better elsewhere, Crane joined up with three other Atari programmers, Larry Kaplan, Alan Miller, and Bob Whitehead. The four approached Kassar about being treated on par with musicians, complete with royalties and credit, and Kassar declined, with Kaplan saying that Kassar said, quote, I've dealt with your kind before. You're a dime a dozen. You're not unique. Anybody can do a cartridge. The line went over about as well as you can imagine. So well that, later in 1979, the four men left Atari and formed Activision, a third-party game that would create Atari products. Atari, now with a new competitor for cartridges, tried new tactics. They complained that the four were, quote, evil, terrible people who were using their knowledge of trade secrets illegally. They threatened to withhold games from retailers who sold Activision titles. In 1980, they sued Activision, saying that the company had violated non-disclosure agreements and was illegally using their knowledge of the system. The lawsuit was settled two years later. Yes, Activision would be forced to pay royalties to Atari, but could proceed with their game creation. This begs the question, did Atari create the third-party model? Yes, with a big butt. It probably would have happened anyway. There was just too much money being left on the table. It does seem clear that Atari's poor treatment of developers, many others would eventually leave for the same reasons, including others who joined Activision or started their own companies, accelerated the creation of the third party model. Again, in doing so, Atari planted the seeds of their own destruction. We're gonna conclude with one of the oldest pieces of video game history and one of the systems that first put Nintendo on the map, the Game & Watch. These small devices were the brainchild of, of Gunpei Yokoi, the legendary Nintendo engineer, who developed a series of other games and systems, including the Game Boy and Virtual Boy. The Game & Watch combined a digital clock with a game. The system, which first came out in 1980, came in pocket-sized forms and allowed players to play many classic games, including Balloon Fight and numerous Mario games. 59 total games were ultimately released on the system. In a way, the origin story of the Game & Watch provides a fascinating view into how we are today. Yokoi got the idea for the Game & Watch from a calculator and a bored businessman. In the late 1970s, Yokoi was riding the bullet train in Japan when his eye was caught by a businessman who was randomly hitting buttons on an LCD calculator. The bored businessman gave Yokoi an idea. If this businessman had a game at his disposal, right there in the subway, would he play it? Yokoi pitched the idea to Nintendo president Hiroshi Yamauchi, who, in turn, pitched the idea to the Sharp Corporation, one of the world's largest manufacturers of calculators. A partnership was born. Sharp sold Nintendo the CPU and hardware, and Yokoi designed the games. The rest is history, and it ultimately set the stage for where we are today. I was on a subway earlier and couldn't help but notice that virtually everyone on the crowded train was looking at their phones. 
Yokoi was more right than he could have ever realized. The Game & Watch ultimately sold 43.4 million units, showed the potential for portable gaming, and set in motion a series of events that would lead to Nintendo becoming one of the most dominant forces in the video game market. I love stuff like this, and I say that for many reasons. Most importantly, video game developers are true creatives, and the work they create is art. As advocated by the four founders of Activision, these men and women deserve to be treated as the deeply dedicated professionals they are. Learning more about what inspires them and their work can hopefully inspire us to do better. So, you made it here. If you did, then you obviously like what we have to offer. And if that's the case, please do like or subscribe or click on the next video that the almighty YouTube algorithm has served to you. Regardless of what you do next, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed watching this video as much as I liked making it. Take care, everybody.